Hey, Jason here. It's 8 a.m. in Oakland, and I'm at the Bonsai Garden at Lake Merritt, and today we're gonna to take a tour of their garden uh, by one of their docents. Uh, we were lucky enough for them uh, to open up early for us, so let's go take a look inside. All right, so let's walk in right now. Um, let's take a look at uh, their entrance really quick. All right, so I'm approaching uh, the entrance right now. Um, there we go. Hey George, how's it going? Hi, good, <laughs> good to good see to you. Good to see you. Hi uh, Janet. To <laughs> good to see you again. Have you been here before? Um, I have, but I'd love to take another tour. It's always different. <laughs> For those who've been here before, um, this bonsai garden is uh, sponsored by the Golden State Bonsai Federation which is a group of um, about 78 clubs throughout, local clubs throughout the state. Um, this bonsai garden, we have about 200 uh, trees, about 100 of which are on display at any time. Uh, this is one of three permanent outdoor bonsai collections sponsored by GSBF. It's on city-owned property, um, but we own all the trees. Um, the, the California native trees include the, the coast live oaks, the redwoods, mm. um, uh, the California junipers. We also have some of the more traditional trees used for bonsai. The Japanese black pines, the Chinese quince, the ume. This is probably the oldest tree inside the garden gate. Okay. Actually, the oldest one is the one that you passed on your way inside. Uh, oh, the one at the front gate, right? Yes, the one by the front gate. Uh, this one is often called a Buddha tree because it looks like a Buddha reclining with his legs crossed in front of him. <laughs> this is a California juniper. Uh, junipers are uh, prized for their dead wood. That's the part with no bark on it. The dead wood is important for a juniper because it helps show its age. But it's also important to see the lifeline of the tree, the part that does have the bark on it. Right. Like from over here, it goes all the way up from the, and it's important to be able to see the lifeline all the way from the soil up to the foliage. And that lets, it know, lets you know it's a real tree. And you see these runners that are poking up. Uh, we're going to let those go for a while because they help pull the energy through the foliage um, and, and keep the tree alive and vibrant. At the end of the season, we'll either wire those down or cut them back to, to stay within the outline of the tree. The idea is that we want there to be each group of branches and pads with space between the branches for the birds to fly through. <laughs> so it'll look like a small, scaled down rendition of a big tree in nature. Janet, can you tell us, uh, maybe show us around some of the historical trees? Yes, we have several historical trees. Um, a lot of people ask about the Lincoln tree. Oh, okay. And that one's over here. Uh, let's take a look around the side. The Lincoln tree um, was brought to the United States during President Lincoln's administration in the 1860s. Oh, wow. It was brought by Mr. Burlingame, after whom the town of Burlingame was named. Uh, at that time, he was the ambassador from the United States to China, and he was traveling back through Japan, where he was given this tree, which is a daimyo oak. This guy back here. Oh, wow. A daimyo oak is, uh, well, you can see it has really gnarly bark and it's hollowed out from its age. Uh, a daimyo oak naturally has very large leaves, but our curator has been able to compress the size of the leaves by defoliating. That is, cutting off every leaf down here by the stem. Uh, during the growing season and then when it comes back it grows back a little bit smaller So by doing that repeated times the leaves get smaller So naturally they would be about 14 inches long and now they're down to like three or four We have several trees that were displayed at the 1915 World's Fair and Exposition on Treasure Island hmm. uh, And so they were already internationally famous bonsai over yeah hundred years ago. Oh, wow. Including this green atlas cedar. Wow. It, uh, after the 1915 World's Fair and Exposition, it went into a private collection and it was there for many years until last fall. And thanks to George Haas, we were able to get this tree 
Oh, um, for the, the gardens collection. Oh, George helped get, get yes, this tree. He did. Oh, wow. And our curator has been working on restyling it and compressing its growth to bring it into a, a more bonsai like shape. This is the moss pine. It's a Japanese black pine that's estimated to be over 400 years old. Oh, wow. Oh, that is beautiful. Right here, the, the Japanese black pines are valued for their um, gnarled bark. Right. The, the very dark black bark and the very dark green needles. And that helps indicate the age as well. Yes, absolutely. Beautiful. So of course it has this great curvature of the trunk line. Yeah, that is a, that is a very nice movement. Beautiful tree. To it. Oh yeah, uh, Janet, yeah, tell us a little about during, the irrigation. During the past year, well, all of these trees need to be watered at, at least daily. Our schedule is set up right now to have this automatic watering system twice a day. Uh, we can turn it off during the rainy season so that, uh, that it, when it's not necessary. But uh, we used to have these uh, tubes going around the surface of the soil. Like the drip, like the drip tubes? Um, or soaker, soaker, soaker hoses? Exactly. But what we found is that uses a tremendous amount of water and mm. a lot of it's wasted. Mm. This method is supposed to use about a third as much water and it also has the benefit of getting the foliage wet. So, you know, when it's a hot day in the summer, it helps to keep them misted. Uh, there's also the downside that with a thick canopy of foliage, oftentimes it prevents the water from reaching the soil. So we find that any system really requires some supplementation. This is on every tree, correct? Every on the irrigation? This correct. Type, that's, so let me take, take a look at this California over here. Look at this. It goes all the way around from the back. Around. And this new watering Amazing. system, as well as our new display tables, were funded in part by our GROW program, the Garden oh. Revitalization Opportunity Program, which uh, has some grants and matching funds, as well as a um, uh, big donation effort uh, during the past couple of years. Stands are designed and built by Jay Van Arsdale, um, skilled in the Japanese art of joinery, mm. uh, the same kind of style that's used for the surrounding fence and the front gate, where it uses uh, traditional Japanese uh, construction methods with no visible glue, screws, or nails. This is a trident maple. You can tell the tridents because the leaves have three points. Unlike the Japanese maples, like this landscape tree over here. Okay. Actually, this is a lace leaf Japanese mm. maple, and the leaves are very pointy and lacy. This one is, is particularly impressive because it has fruits on it. Oh, yeah. We love to see. Um, trees. What was this tree again? This is a myrtle leaf orange. Okay. This is a, a high mountain pine. You can tell the difference between the white pines and the black pines because the white pines, and let me find a good example here, it's a five needle pine. So the needles grow in bundles of five. It's maybe a little more visible on the tree itself. Whereas the black pines grow in bundles of two. So the white pines are really uh, good for bonsai because the needles are very short. You see they're small and they, they can make nice, neat, tidy pads. The roots of white pines are not as strong as the roots of black pines. So oftentimes a white pine is grafted onto black pine root stock. And then the... For the to uh, have healthier, stronger roots. Strong right? roots. Um, and gnarly bark and small foliage. So it gets the best of both varieties. All right, looks like the, the sprinklers are turning on right here. Oh, that's a nice sound. All the trees are getting watered right now. All right, Janet is showing us the showing collection here. Under the spring rain, we have the show team, and the show team trees are those that are um, seven inches or less. Uh, this particular area, was developed um, by Gordon Deed, uh, and it was inspired by Mary Sakaishi. Actually, she inspired the companion plant display. Oh, right. These, the companion plants are often displayed with a bonsai 
uh, in order to show what season it is or to show what part of the uh, environment it grows in. Like a high mountain tree might be displayed with a succulent, whereas a, a desert tree would be displayed with a grass. So we, we keep these so that they're um, oftentimes displayed with a bonsai. So what does it take to, to keep this place up and running, all the trees healthy? I mean, what, you know, obviously it's a big team, but how big is that team? Well, the big team is run by our chairperson, Joe Bird, and uh, our curator, Kathy Shaner. Uh, she also oversees uh, several assistant curators. So that's where our assistant curators and our 80 or so volunteers. <laughs> 80 or so. <laughs> well, there's 80 or so active ones. Mm, okay. There's many sporadic ones. Um, some of our volunteers serve as docents. Some do um, general cleanup, like a weeding of the landscape areas. We have two guys who take care of the landscape trees. Mm. Uh, and it's just an ongoing effort. Janet, show us, uh, show us the store here. Our museum store has a variety of hats, <laughs> um, aprons. Oh, fantastic. Uh, shirts. This is an actual tree in the yeah. garden. This isn't just a drawing. This is a real redwood. Um, I know that um, over here at the Bones Garden, Lake Merritt, there's a, a lot of programs. Can you tell us uh, you know, about some of those? Uh, here at the garden, we have an introduction to bonsai course that's presented on the fourth Sunday of each month. Every month, one o'clock till three or so, uh, you can sign up in advance, and it's presented by instructors from the East Bay Bonsai Society. Mm, okay. um, every month, it's a different instructor. I think we have five or six right now who kind of rotate through the program. Are those classes all held here? They're held right <laughs> here in the workshop area. Actually, the display area that we're just leaving has the hundred trees that are um, on pedestals. The ones back here are the ones that are not quite ready for display. Mm. They're being worked on or repotted or restyled or brought back to health or grafted or something. So here's our trees that are not ready for display. This is the area where we held workshops, um, both private workshops and those with Kathy Shaner, our curator, as well as the fourth Sunday introduction to bonsai course. We have our soil containers that mm. are in oh, these large so. cans so we can pull them around to where we need them. So neatly organized, very nice. Uh, it looks good today. <laughs> Here's wire. Very nice. Here's we have our tool kits. Oh, yes. Oh, and look at that. They're all color coded for students. That's, that is mm -hmm. amazing. So back here we have a little bit different watering system. Oh, right. We have these overhead sprayers because the trees are not on individual pedestals and we might need to be moving these around to different locations. So these are the ones that are under development. Yeah. And you got all the pots underneath. Well, we have a wonderful variety of pots. Actually, uh, Joe was very instrumental during the last few years in redoing this whole area. This bonsai garden was originally conceived by uh, Bill Hashimoto and Toichi Demoto, who in the 1970s thought there should be a place to keep these old legacy trees. And then um, Gloria Clemenson also supported their vision. And uh, then when she passed away, her estate, her bonsai were sold and it formed the seed money to create this bonsai garden. So this mm. docent house is named after her because she was instrumental in forming the basis for this whole entire garden. Then the Golden State Bonsai Federation, who at the time um, was headed by Hideko Metaxas, mm. uh, she was then the president of the Golden State Bonsai Federation, and they spearheaded a fundraising effort to create this whole garden. Then John North, was instrumental with Seiji Shiba in negotiating with the city of Oakland to acquire this land from which this whole garden was built. And then the construction took place during the mid-1990s. In fact, I was one of the people who helped build oh, really? the fence. <laughs> yes, yes, it's so exciting. Um, and it opened in 1997, dedication in 1998, and has evolved since then.
We can offer literature and sign-ups for any of our programs. We also have materials for uh, most of our local bonsai clubs. So in case people who visit the garden are interested in pursuing an interest in bonsai, we can refer them to a local club. That's, that's one of the best places to learn, right? Local clubs? Absolutely. Uh, you know, you can learn online, you can learn from books, you, but you really kind of need a hands-on education to see how it applies in reality. So that's why we encourage people to get connected with the local club and get access to workshops and bonsai masters and speakers so that they can see what bonsai really is. Great. Thanks for the tour, Janet. My pleasure. <laughs> So I just wanted to thank uh, George and Janet for giving us that great tour of the Bonsai Garden at Lake Merritt. Um, if you've got time, come check it out. It's in Oakland and features some fantastic trees. Thanks for watching and let us know where we should go next.